Chapter 23 Stand by your beds, Bruff ordered, his face stark and drawn. The king shot a murderous glance at Max, who was the knight's lookout. Max had failed in his job. He had said, cops, and not noticed the Japanese. If he had said, Japs, a different plan would have been used. Peter Marlowe tried to get to his feet. Standing made his nausea worse, so he stumbled to the king's table and leaned against it. Yoshima was looking down at the money on the table. Bruff had already seen it and winced. Gray had noticed it and his pulse had quickened. Where did this money come from? Yoshima said. There was a vast silence. Then Yoshima shouted, Where did this money come from? The king was dying inside. He had seen Shigata, and knew Shigata was nervous, and the king knew he was within an ace of Utrum Road. It's gambling money, sir. Yoshima walked the length of the hut until he was in front of the king. None from Black Market, he asked. No, sir, he said, forcing a smile. Peter Marlowe felt the vomit rising. He reeled heavily and almost fell, and could not keep his eyes focused. Can I sit, please, he said. Yoshima looked down the room and noticed the armband. What is an English officer doing here? He was surprised, for his informants had told him there was very little fraternization with the Americans. I was just visiting, but Peter Marlowe could not continue. Excuse, he lurched to the window and vomited. What's the matter with him? Yoshima asked. I think, it's fever, sir. You? Yoshima said to Tex, sit him on that chair. Yes, sir, Tex said. Yoshima looked back at the king. How is there so much money without black market? He said silkily. The king was conscious of the eyes upon him, and conscious of the appalling silence and conscious of the diamond inside him, and conscious of Shigata in the doorway. He cleared his throat. Just, we've, saved our dough for gambling. Yoshima's hand cracked against the king's face, rocking him backward. Liar, the blow did not hurt, really, but at the same time it seemed to be a death smash. My god, the king told himself, I'm dead. My luck's run out, Captain Yoshima. Bruff began to walk up the length of the hut. He knew there was no use in trying to interfere, perhaps he would make it worse, but he had to try. Shut up, Yoshima said, the man lies. Everyone knows. Stinking yank. Yoshima turned his back on Bruff and looked up at the king. Give me your water bottle. In a dream, the king got his bottle off the shelf and handed it to Yoshima. The Japanese poured the water out, shook the bottle and peered into it. Then he tossed it on the floor and moved to Tex. Give me your water bottle. Peter Marlowe's stomach heaved again. What about the water bottles? His brain screamed. Are Mac and Larkin being searched? And what happens if Yoshima asks for mine? He gagged and staggered to the window. Yoshima worked his way around the hut, examining every bottle. At last he stood in front of Peter Marlowe. Your water bottle. I, began Peter Marlowe, and again nausea overwhelmed him and buckled his knees and he was beyond speech. Yoshima turned to Shigata and said something furiously in Japanese at him. Shigata said, Hi, you, Yoshima pointed at Gray. Go with this man and the guard and get the water bottle. Very well. Excuse me, sir, the king said quickly. His water bottle's here. The king reached under his bed and pulled out a bottle, his spare, kept in secret against a rainy day. Yoshima took it. It was very heavy, heavy enough to contain a radio or part of a radio. He pulled out the cork and upended it. A stream of dry rice grains poured out, and kept pouring until it was empty and light. No radio inside. Yoshima hurled the bottle away. Where is the radio? He shouted. There isn't one, began Bruff, hoping to God Yoshima wouldn't ask him why the Englishman, who was visiting, should put his water bottle under a bed. Shut up. Yoshima and the guards searched the hut, making sure that there were no more water bottles, and then Yoshima went through the water bottles again. Where is the water bottle radio? He shouted. I know it is here. That one of you has it. Where is it? There's no radio here, Bruff repeated. If you like we'll strip the whole hut for you. Yoshima knew that somehow his information was wrong. 
This time he had not been told the hiding place, only that it was contained in a water bottle, or water bottles, and tonight one of the men who owned it was, at this moment, in the American hut. His eyes looked at each man, who, oh, he could certainly march them all up to the guardhouse, but that wouldn't help, not without the radio. The general didn't like failures, and without the radio, so this time he had failed. He turned to Gray, you will inform the camp commandant that all water bottles are confiscated. They are to be taken up to the guardhouse tonight. Yes, sir, Gray said. His whole face seemed eyes. Yoshima realized that by the time the water bottles were taken to the guardhouse the one or ones containing the radio would be buried or hidden. But that didn't matter, it would make the search easier, for the hiding place would have to be changed, and in the changing eyes would be watching. Who would have thought a radio could be put inside a water bottle? Yankee pigs, he snarled. You think you're so clever, so strong, so big, well, remember. If this war lasts a hundred years we will beat you. Even if you beat the Germans. We can fight on alone. You will never beat us, never. You may kill many of us, but we will kill many more of you. You will never conquer us. Because we are patient and not afraid to die. Even if it takes two hundred years, eventually we will destroy you. Then he stormed out. Bruff turned on the king. You're supposed to be on the ball and you let the Jap bastard and guards walk into the hut, with all that loot spread around. You need your head examined. Yes, sir, I sure as hell do. And another thing, where's the diamond? What diamond, sir? Bruff sat down. Colonel Smedley Taylor called me in and said that Captain Gray had information that you've got a diamond ring you're not supposed to have. You, and Flight Lieutenant Marlow. Of course, any searching to be done, I've got to be present. And I've no objection to Captain Gray looking, so long as I'm here. We were just about to hightail it over here when Yoshima busted in with his guards and started yakking about he was going to search this hut. One of you was supposed to have a radio in a water bottle. How crazy can you get? Gray and I were told to go with him. Now that the search was over, he thanked God there was no water bottled radio here and he knew also that Peter Marlow and the king were part of the radio detail. Why else would the king pretend that an American water bottle belonged to the Englishman? All right, Bruff said to the king, take your clothes off. You're going to be searched, and your bunk and your black box. He turned around, the rest of you guys keep it quiet and get on with your game. He glanced back at the king, unless you want to hand over the diamond. What diamond, sir? As the king began undressing, Bruff went over to Peter Marlowe. Anything I can get you, Pete? He asked. Just some water. Tex, Bruff ordered, get some water. Then to Peter Marlowe, you look terrible, what is it? Just, fever, feel rough. Peter Marlowe lay back on Tex's bed and forced a weak smile. That bloody Jap frightened me to death. Me too. Gray went through the king's clothes and the black box and his shelves and the sack of beans, and the men were astonished when the search failed to uncover the diamond. Marlowe, Gray stood in front of him. Peter Marlowe's eyes were bloodshot, and he could hardly see. Yes, I want to search you. Listen, Gray, Bruff said. You're within your rights to search here if I'm here. But you got no authority. It's all right, Peter Marlowe said. I don't mind. If I, don't, he'll only, think. Give me a hand, will you? Peter Marlowe took off his sarong and threw it and the inch of money onto a bed. Gray went through the hems carefully. Angrily, he threw the sarong back. Where did you get this money? Gambling, Peter Marlowe said, retrieving his sarong. You, Gray barked at the king. What about this? He held up another inch of notes. Gambling, sir? The king said innocently, as he dressed, and Bruff hid a smile. Where's the diamond? What diamond, sir? Bruff got up and moved down to the poker table. Looks as though there's no diamond. Then where did all this money come from? The man says that it's gambling money. There's no law against gambling. Of course I don't approve of gambling either, he added with a thin smile, his eyes on the king. You know that's not possible, Gray said. It's not probable, 
if that's what you mean, interrupted Bruff. He was sorry for Grey, with his death bright eyes, his mouth twitching and his hands palsied, sorry for him. You wanted to search here, and you've searched, and there's no diamond. He stopped as Peter Marlowe began to reel towards the door. The king caught him just before he fell. Here, I'll help you, the king said. I'd better take him to his hut. You stay here, said Bruff. Grey, maybe you'd give him a hand. He can drop dead as far as I'm concerned. Grey's eyes went to the king. You too, but not before I've called you. And I will. When you do, I'll throw the book at him. Bruff glanced at the king. Right, yes, sir. Bruff glanced back at Grey. But until you do, or he disobeys my orders, there's nothing to be done. Then order him to stop black marketing, Grey said. Bruff kept his temper. Anything for a peaceful life, he said, and felt his men's contempt and smiled inside. Sons of bitches. You, he said to the king, you're ordered to stop black marketing. As I understand black marketing it means to sell food and goods, anything, to your own people, for profit. You're not to sell anything for profit. Dealing in contraband, that's black marketing. Captain Gray, selling for profit or even stealing from the enemy is not black marketing. There's no harm in a little trading, but it's against orders, Jap orders, and I don't acknowledge enemy orders. And they are the enemy. Bruff wanted to end this nonsense. No black marketing. It's ordered. You Americans stick together, I'll say that for you. Now don't you start. I've had enough for one night from Yoshima. No one's black marketing here or breaking any laws that are laws, so far as I know. Now that's the end of it. I catch anyone stealing anything or selling food for profit or drugs for profit I'll break his arm off myself and stuff it down his throat. And I'm senior American officer and these are my men and that's what I say. Understand? Gray stared at Bruff and promised himself that he would watch him too. Rotten people, rotten officers. He turned and stalked out of the hut. Help Peter back to his bunk, Tex, said Bruff. Sure. Don, Tex lifted him in his arms and grinned at Bruff. Like a baby, sir, he said and went out. Bruff stared at the money on the poker table. Yep, he said, nodding, as though to himself, gambling's no good. No goddamn good at all. He looked up at the king and said sweetly, I don't approve of gambling, do you? Watch yourself, the king told himself, Bruff's got that mean officer look about him. Why is it only son of a bitch officers get that look and why is it you always know it? And can always smell the danger twenty feet away? Well, the king said, offering Bruff a cigarette and holding the light for him, I guess it depends on how you look at it. Thanks. Nothing like a tailor made. Once more Bruff's eyes locked on the king's. And how do you look at it, corporal? If I'm winning, it looks good. If I'm losing, not so good. And added under his breath, you son of a bitch, what the hell's on your mind? Bruff grunted and looked at the stack of notes in front of the place where the king had been seated. Nodding thoughtfully, he thumbed through the notes and held them in his hand. All of them. His eyes saw the large piles in front of every place. Looks like everybody's winning in this school, he said reflectively to no one in particular. The king didn't answer. Looks like you could afford a contribution. Huh? Yes. Huh? God damn it. Bruff held up the notes. About this much. To go into the goddamn pool. Officers and enlisted men alike. The king moaned. Best part of four hundred dollars. Jesus. Don. Gambling's a bad habit, like swearing, god damn it. You play cards, you might just lose the money, then where'd you be? A contribution save your soul for better things. Barter, you fool, the king told himself. Settle for half. Gee, I'd be happy to. Good, Bruff turned to Max. You too, Max. But sir, the king began heatedly. You've had your say. Max tried not to look at the king, and Bruff said, that's right, Max. You look at him. Good man. He's made a contribution. Why the hell can't you? Bruff took three-fourths of the notes from each stack and counted the money quickly. In front of them, the king had to sit and watch. 
that makes 10 bucks a man a week for six weeks, said Bruff. Thursday's payday. Oh yeah, Max, collect all water bottles and take them up to the guardhouse. Right now, he stuffed the money into his pocket, then walked to the door. At the door he had a sudden thought. He took the notes out once more and peeled off a single $5 bill. Looking at the king, he tossed it into the center of the table. Burying money, his smile was angelic. Night, you guys. Throughout the camp, the collection of water bottles was underway. Mac and Larkin and Peter Marlowe were in the bungalow. On the bed, beside Peter Marlowe, were their water bottles. We could take the wireless out of them and drop the cases down a borehole, Mac said. Those bloody bottles are going to be difficult to hide now. We could drop M as they are down a borehole, Larkin said. You don't really mean that, do you, Colonel? asked Peter Marlowe. No, Cobber, but I said it, and we should all decide what to do. Mac picked up one of the bottles. Perhaps they'll return the other ones in a day or so. We canna hide the guts of the bottles any better than they're hid now. He looked up and said venomously, but who's the bastard who knows? They stared at the water bottles. Isn't it about time to listen for the news? Peter Marlowe said. A laddie, Max said and looked at Larkin. I agree, he said. The king was still awake when Timson peered through the window. Cobber, yeah, Timson held up a bundle of notes. We got the ten you paid. The king sighed and he opened his black box and paid Timson what was owed. Thanks, Cobber, Timson chuckled. Here you had a set to with Gray and Yoshima. So, nothing, just a pity Gray didn't find the stone. I wouldn't be in your shoes, or Pete's for that. Oh dear, no, very dangerous, right? Go to hell, Timson. Timson laughed. Just a friendly warning, right? Oh, yus. The first shipment of nettings under the hut, enough for a hundred or so cages. He peeled off one hundred and twenty dollars. I sold the first shipment at thirty a leg. Here's your cut, fifty-fifty. Who got, M? Um, Timson winked. Just friends of mine, Knight, Cobber, the king relaxed in his bed and rechecked to see that the net was once more tight under his mattress. He was alert for danger. He knew that he could not go to the village for two days, and between then and now, many eyes would be watching and waiting. That night his sleep was fitful, and the next day he stayed in the hut surrounded by guards. After lunch there was a sudden search of the bungalow area. Three times the guards went through the little rooms before the search was called off. At nightfall Mac groped his way to the latrine area and pulled up the three water bottles that were dangling on a string in one of the boreholes. He cleaned them and brought them back to the room and connected them. He, Larkin and Peter Marlowe listened to the news, memorizing it. Afterwards, he did not take the bottles back to their cache, for though he had been cautious, he knew he had been observed. The three of them decided not to hide the bottles anymore. They knew, without despair, that very soon they would be caught.